Alright. Previously on a suburban fantasy, Rachel and Smith was a teenage girl who was turned into a vampire against her will by a serial killing monster named Eckhart Gaines. She managed to escape from his evil clutches and returned to her geeky friends where they helped her reacclimate with her life, but it didn't take long for Eckhart Gaines to hunt her down and uh, screw all that up. He uh, plunged her life into chaos, and then the bees descended. And nobody knows where the bees came from, but a swarm of them have descended over the city, and Rachel has tried to save as many people as she could, but so far it's not going so well. Her mother, Hannah, knows has come up with a lead as to who might be behind the bees, and uh, she was seeking it out. Um, just outside the city limits, which was lucky because she avoided the swarm. Um, nobody else was that lucky. And uh, R Rachel has recently uh, uh, joined with her friend Tanya, the school president, who believes that the person behind the bees might just be her father. All right, let's go ahead. Um, keep going with this. All right. Hannah bursts from the front door of Kieran's apartment building in a hurry to get to her car. She'd already spent far too long in Burlington. Her family was in Oakville, and she was doing the only right thing she could think of. Going home. You can't go, Kieran called after her. You're the only one who knows about me now. I'm begging for your help. Then come with me, Hannah said, shrugging impatiently, leaning against her car. Kieran looked out at the black swarm in the distance. What if it gets worse? She said, and Hannah was reminded of her earlier judgments of the woman, namely accusing her of being paranoid. Hannah now saw that it was much more than that. Underneath Kieran's dark, tough exterior, the role she plays in public, the force to be reckoned with was all the mask to hide the sad truth that she was little more than an afraid little girl. You know, you know, I, I'm scared too, Hannah told the woman. Don't go mouth Kieran. We're all scared, Hannah said, opening the door of her car, but I have a responsibility to the mayor, to the city, and most importantly to my family. She stepped into her car and lowered the window. Stay here or come with me, Hannah said, no longer caring which the woman would choose, but tell me where his secret lab is. Let me help my husband and two kids, Kieran. Kieran's features softened in defeat. You know that new hotel opening up in Glen Abbey? she asked. Scene change. Scene change. Scene change. Three of them. All right. Uh, I always thought that thing was bullshit, Rachel said with triumph. I mean, how much tourism could Oakville possibly attract? Tanya couldn't help but frown at Rachel's comment. She'd always tried not to criticize her father's decisions in office because she knew how hard it was to make everyone happy. She respected her father and always thought she could trust him. She'd never realized how self-centered she'd been. He'd always taken an interest in her life, and yet she'd never once asked him about his. Never even crossed her mind that there might be more to him than just her loving father. I think we have an idea on how to get us there through the. I think I have an idea on how to get us there through the storm. Tanya said, ch changing the topic. She turned her. She turned on her GPS and typed in the address of the hotel. With turn-by-turn -turn directions, we should have no problem navigating the roads. Please find the street. The voice said in an eerie, in a, the voice said in her annoyingly a not, bleh, I'm not reading so good today. Please find the street. The voice said in her annoyingly monotonous tone. Tanya rolled her eyes at the machine. Easier said than done, she muttered, putting her van in reverse. There was a large bump as she went back over the curb, and suddenly they were on the street again. Keep straight for three kilometers and then turn left. The computer voice said loudly through the car speakers. That's what I'm talking about, Tanya said with satisfaction. She was back on the road again. She probably felt the happiest when she was traveling. She liked to be in motion. After all, wasn't it true that life was all about change? Do you think we can talk about your dad? Rachel asked. We don't know it's him yet, Tanya said. She wasn't quite ready to accept it and really didn't want to think any didn't really want to think about it any more. Why don't we talk about why no one told me Eckhart was at school today, she suggested instead. Well, Rachel said with irritation, if you're going to skip school, you have to accept that you're going to miss a thing or two. 
Tanya couldn't believe her ears. Are you nerd lecturing me? You know, Rachel said, I don't know if I really appreciate the way you treat my friends. Last time I checked, nerds were cool or something. Something, Tanya said, peering across at Rachel. I only think, I only like nerdy on you. The computer chimed in suddenly. Make a left, now, it said, and Tanya followed the prompt. She was trying not to go too fast, and was happy that she wouldn't need to drive much further. Straight another eight kilometers, it said. I'm sorry, Tanya said to Rachel. I'm a bitch, I know, she sighed. Ah, <sighs> it's been a rough day. Rachel laughed. It really has, she said between breaths. Neither girl talked for a number of awkward moments, and then T Tanya moved to make things even more awkward. I was going to ask you out this morning. She admitted to Rachel, blurting it out before she really knew what she was doing. I don't know why it was so important to me. I kind of fixate on things. It was true, she'd been just fine staying below the radar, but it wasn't enough for her that morning. Last year's student council president had been easily the coolest guy, and Tanya had fallen in love with him. It had been to get his attention that she ran for president and won. Maybe not things, Tanya admitted. People, it went without saying. Rachel didn't say anything for a moment. Ian tried to ask me out today, too. Yeah, Tanya said. I heard. Well, Rachel said, I'm going to tell you what I should have told him. I'm not ready for any kind of relationship right now. I feel so messed up. My entire universe has been thrown into chaos, and the last thing I want to do is bring someone else down with me. Tanya wanted something to say, but couldn't think of anything, and Rachel just continued. I don't even know if I swing that way. Did you like the kiss? Tanya asked, coming across as more self-conscious than she really was. That doesn't make me a lesbian, does it? Yes, Tanya said. Rachel shut up, and Tanya laughed awkwardly. I'm just kidding. Go on. Make a right in 500 meters, the GPS timed in. I'm just not comfortable in my own skin, Rachel concluded. Until I am, I don't think I can open up to anyone, you or Ian. What about Matt Damon? Tanya asked, uh, trying to make light of the situation in an attempt to mask the emotional punch she had just felt in her gut. Well, said Rachel with a grin, maybe t Matt Damon. GPS timed one final time. You have arrived at your destination, the female monotone vo voice said before silencing for good. Tanya studied the screen. The hotel should be just ahead. All right said Rachel, tr taking a deep, steadying breath. I'm going to take a look inside. You should stay in the car till I get back. Tanya was going to protest, but then the door was open and Rachel was gone. Tanya almost even considered doing as she was told, but that idea was quickly struck down. Like hell that's going to happen, she muttered to herself, opening the door and following Rachel into the swarm. It was worse than she could have possibly imagined. She couldn't breathe without bees trying to get into her mouth or up her nose. They were everywhere, getting tangled in her hair and her clothing. She was stung, and again and again and again and again. She wanted to just curl into a ball and cry until death embraced her, but she was far too stubborn for that. She tried to block out the pain as well as the instinct to run around waving her hands in the air like a crazy person. Instead, she tried to fo she tried focusing on just placing one foot in front of the other, really, really quickly. So quickly, that when she ran into the metal gate she'd completely forgotten was even there, she hit it so hard her nose broke. She fell to the ground, her face suddenly awash with a different kind of pain. Her vision was fuzzy and the bees were everywhere. She felt dizzy and sick and completely overwhelmed. Maybe it was from all the bee stings. Oh, there was another one. Or maybe she just maybe she'd just been concussed on impact. She could have given up then and let the blackness envelop her, but a figure leaned over her, a hand was offered, and Tanya let the teen vampire pull her to her feet. We have to keep moving, Rachel said, not seeming at all surprised that Tanya had gone after her. Stupid gate, Tanya said uh, tried to say, but the words came out as little more than a whimper. <laughs> Stand back. Rachel said, and there was a loud crash as she presumably broke the gate down. Suddenly she was back and grabbing Tanya's hand. Come on! Tanya was more being dragged along than keeping up, her legs giving way under her more than once. 
There was a burning in her lungs, and a bee had flown, had flew awfully high up her pant leg. They came to a stop, and Tanya could only hope Rachel had found a sliding door. Forcing it open, the teen vampire threw Tanya into a dark room where she collapsed against a wall. Rachel came in behind her through the swarm of bees pushing to get their way inside. The vampire finally got the door closed, and, as soon as the seal was in place, the lights came on. There was a strange, loud crackle in the air, and Tanya could feel the hairs all over her body stand on edge, just before every single bee in the metallic room suddenly plummeted straight to the ground. And then there was silence. Tanya was thankful for the moment to breathe, her mind replaying the horrible journey from her van again and again in her mind. She couldn't speak, couldn't move, could do nothing but stare at the perfectly smooth and polished metal wall of the strange quarantine room they'd now found themselves in. Rachel leaned over her and frowned as she gingerly touched Tanya's nose. Tanya flinched away from the pain. That looks bad, Rachel said. You really should have stayed in the car. I'm all right. Tanya said, catching Rachel's eye stubbornly. She wiped the blood from her nose with her arm and said, I just need a moment. Somewhere else to her boot, somewhere close to her boot, a bee struggled vain valiantly under some imaginary weight. None of the bees were dead, just seemingly incapable of moving. Reaching out with her leg, Tanya stomped on the bug angrily. I think I'm going to be scarred for life, she admitted to Rachel. So, not all right, Rachel said with worry. Just saying, that was the worst experience of my life. Tanya said. She could feel the, she could still feel them all over her. Her skin felt like leather. She felt sick. Rachel just nodded. Top three, she said. Tanya knew things had been really hard for Rachel lately, but what Tanya hadn't seen was how strong the teen vampire had been in facing them. Tanya saw now that she wasn't stronger than Rachel. She knew right then that she was in love with the vampire not because of how fragile she was, but because the small girl was stronger than any of the rest of them. Taking a scrunchie from her pocket, Tanya tied her hair back and away from her face. Have you found anything? Tanya asked, wanting desperately to focus on the problem at hand, mainly the accusation that her father was attempting to tear a hole in space to travel through time again. There's a control pad, Rachel said from across the room. Requires a numbered password. Rachel shrugged. I don't know what it could be. The door looks reinforced, but I could probably break it. Wait. Tanya said, getting to her feet. If it's really my dad, then I should be able to guess his password. After all, he only ever used the same four-digit code. 1908. And then Tanya's brain connected the dots. All as the control pad accepted her input and turned green. I'm starting to think it might really be him after all, Tanya understated. There was another crackle, and an electric shock zapped the floor, killing all the bees. Tanya and Rachel both shrieked in surprise and pain, but they quickly turned silent as the door swung open. Tanya didn't know why, but she was sort of expecting a normal hotel lobby on the other side of the door. It seemed silly afterwards, of course, but she certainly hadn't been expecting what awaited them as they stepped into the main part of the building. The skyscraper was in fact completely hollow, except for a large metal column towering to the ceiling and covered in wires and glowing power conduits and all sorts of other things Tanya couldn't even explain. There was a system, or perhaps maze was a better word, of catwalks surrounding the column, and a number of large rotating arms spun lazily in circles around the center. Though they had just come through the front door, the building didn't just span out above them. There were even more catwalks below the one they'd just stepped on, and the tower continued for another number of floors beneath them. Ladies and gentlemen, Rachel muttered as she tried to spot the bottom, our tax dollars at work. You don't even pay taxes, Tanya butted bitterly. She didn't care whether or not her dad was guilty. She was ready to give him the benefit of the doubt in a way she supposed she kind of had to. He'd earned at least that much from her. Dad? She called out as loud as she could. Dad! <clears throat> the rotating arms were quite loud as they whooshed over her head. There was motion high above her, and Tanya looked up to see her dad's frame watching them. <clears throat> Water break. Do 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 do. Ah. Water break. Do 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 do. Water break. Um, Mr. Dixon! Rachel yelled at him. You have to stop your machine! Tanya's father didn't say anything, but simply watched from above like a silent observer. Two security guards, one Asian and one ca Caucasian, stepped out from stairs leading out of sight. They were both jacked up as if on steroids. 
We've been told to escort you out, the white guy said. You should probably just turn around now. My friend knows Kung Fu. The Asian guard flashed a white smile. Don't mind him, he said. Eamon is just really racist. He laughed and continued. Of course, I really don't need to know Kung Fu when I bench press 250 pounds. And Tanya believed him. They were big and using their size to push Rachel back. Of course, Rachel repeated. Excellent, Eamon said. He cracked his knuckle against the palm of his other hand and smiled. Now we're clear. Why don't you ladies make your way back out into the swarm? Sorry. Uh, Miss... Mr. Dixon won't give us an audience? Rachel asked quietly, planting her feet. They kept pushing, pressing right up against the girl's small frame, and looking down on her. She crossed her arms, and it was a standoff. This is completely unnecessary. Tanya tried to push past Rachel. Listen, she told the guards. My name is Shauna Dixon. I'm his daughter. I think he'd want to talk to me. Well... You're wrong, the other guard said. If you're really his girl, then he's the worst father of all time. We have our orders. His muscles tensed, making it quite clear his orders included possibly roughing up a couple teenage girls. We're all friends here, Rachel said softly, not at all impressed. She burst into a flurry of motion, climbing the Asian's tall frame and kicking off his face a leap to Eamon's back. Eamon screamed and spasmed sharply in an attempt to shake Rachel off. Dangling from his neck, she choked him out with a sleeper hold and then kicked the other guard in the chest as the man rose to fight back, knocking the air out of his lungs and his ass back to the floor. Holy crap, Tanya complained, secretly relieved he hadn't shrieked again. Those are people, Rachel. I get cranky when I'm hungry, Rachel said with a shrug. If I don't deal with this quickly and get home for a drink, I think I might bite someone. Tanya's dad finally woke up, finally spoke up, his voice ringing through the building. Interesting friends you have here. Oh, I'm sorry. His voice was more like Liquid Snake from Metal Gear Solid. Solid Snake. It's me, Liquid. Yes. All right, I got it. Tanya's dad finally spoke up, his voice ringing through the building. Interesting friends you have, Shauna. We met at school, Tanya called up to him, trying to play it cool. Guess you and I both have secrets. I know all about 1908. My password. Rachel didn't seem to be watching Tanya's dad anymore. Instead, she was searching the machine with her gaze. You think that's important? The vampire asked rhetorically, pointing to a glowing yellow rock a couple catwalks below them. It was situated in the center of the pillar, and every wire Tanya could see seemed to lead directly to it. I would advise I would strongly advise against touching that. Tanya's father called down. I bet you would, Rachel grumbled. She was already looking for a way down. Rachel, wait, Tanya said, not quite sure what she was going to say, even as she said it. Let me talk to him. Good luck with that. Talking, Rachel said with a snort. <laughs> not really my style. She was already climbing over the railing and grabbing onto a hose that trailed from around the base. She flung herself to a control box a few, fleet, a few feet below her and shimmied along sideways as one of the rotating arms passed underneath her. She dropped from there to hang from a power conduit leading into the glowing rock. How much you want to bet if I remove this, his whole building just stops working. His whole machine, sorry. Rachel called up to Tanya. She reached for the rock, and as her hand touched the ground, uh, as her hand touched the glowing surface, there was a bright flash. Rachel was thrown like a rag doll across the lab, hitting the far wall head first with a loud crack. Rachel, Tanya called as Rachel's body slumped to the ground. Her head had crumpled in an odd angle, and she wasn't moving at all. Could vampires survive breaking their necks? I tried to warn her, Dixon said with a little concern in his voice. That might have been going a little to Agent Smith. I tried to warn her. Yes, Metal Gear. <laughs> Solid Snake. It's me, your brother, Liquid. Sorry. Um, shut up. Um, maybe I should go back to his line. I tried to warn her, Dixon said with little concern in his voice. Shut up. Tanya yelled after her father, really starting to panic now. What if Rachel was dead, and without her, who was going to stop Tanya's dad from leaving for the future? 
Tanya didn't think she had the strength to do it herself. She didn't even know if she wanted to try. Still, almost dutifully, she found the nearest ladder leading up the center of the spire, and she started to climb. She wasn't quite like Rachel, though. Woman on a mission or not, Tanya had to say something. How could you keep such a big secret from me and Mom for so long? She asked loudly to be heard. She just didn't get it. Did you ever love us at all? It's so much more complicated than that. Her father was on the move, crossing the catwalk and typing something into a control panel. He then hit two buttons on the wall and pulled up a lever. In 1908, I'd stumbled onto something so powerful that I was ready to use it without even considering the consequences. Her father rambled on as she got off the ladder onto another catwalk. She jogged the distance across the catwalk to a rickety metal staircase leading up to an even higher catwalk. What consequences? Tanya asked as she took the stairs two at a time. A rotating arm passed so close to her she was almost blown off, and yet to grab the railing for support. Like, how you couldn't go back? She asked when she'd regained her balance. No, her dad responded. Like how I didn't have enough energy to go far enough. He said on a lower catwalk now and lifting another lever. Like how the Dixonite would be only one use. I didn't think I would ever get another chance, he said, leaning over the railing to be sure Tanya would hear him. Tanya reached the top of the stairs and crossed yet another catwalk. This one had a ladder in the middle leading straight up. I arrived in 1975, and for a while I just tried to keep a low profile. He dropped to a lower catwalk yet again and started making adjustments on something out of sight. Turns out there was, in fact, a cult that knew about my time traveling. They'd read about it in Edison's journal, if you can believe that. <clears throat> they'd been waiting my they'd been awaiting my arrival. Ironically, I'd heard of them before they'd got wind that I was there. To escape their gaze I moved to Canada. And became mayor? Tanya asked. That was after. First I met your mother, he explained. And to answer your question, yes. I love her, and you. I thought I could make it work. I married your mother, thinking I was ready to grow old and actually die. He seemed to shudder at the thought. Water break, do 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 do. Man, I'm actually really hungry. I hope this is almost over. Ah. Uh. <clears throat> um. Yeah. They were finally on the same catwalk. You have to turn off your machine, she said, crossing her arms. There's a swarm of bees outside plaguing your city, and it's completely your fault. Yes, the bees are unfortunate, side effect, her dad said, not seeming to be much concerned. But we're well protected in here. He tightened a knob and pushed two red buttons. They turned green, and he lifted another lever. As for the machine, he told his daughter, believe it or not, I haven't even turned it on yet. He smiled to her. I still need to lock in all the safeties. But it shocked Rachel, Tanya argued. Yes, well, the element is live, he explained. Changing the topic, he pointed over her shoulder and said, There's a lock behind you. Do you think you could be a deer and seal it for me? Tanya didn't move. So what was your plan then? She asked instead. Was he just going to leave them without even saying goodbye? Did you even think about me at all? Or mom? Of course, he told her. I've left you both a lot of money. He laughed. <laughs> like, I mean, a lot. Printed as American one dollar bills, it would fill this entire building. I don't care about the money, Tanya said angrily. That's just because you've never been without. He told her, once again treating her like a kid, that's when you realize the true worth of money. He stepped around Tanya and pushed the buttons himself. Tanya wanted to hit him. She wanted to start a fight. He was a bad guy, after all. Wasn't that how it was supposed to end? She almost felt like he was daring her to strike him, to break the familial truce between them. But she couldn't do it. He was still their father. When did you decide we weren't enough for you? She asked instead as he pulled the lever up, locking it in place. About fifteen years ago, 
he told her. I mean, I really tried. Oh, I forgive you then, she said sarcastically. You wouldn't understand, he complained, le leaning against the railing and bowing his head. Growing, growing old doesn't get any easier as you get older. I tried to be strong in all the ways a father is supposed to be, but I wasn't ready for my life to end like that. He started climbing back up, even as he continued. So, I decided I had to get resources if I was going to attempt the impossible twice. Tanya was following close behind him. I had to be careful how to do it, or else risk catching the attention of that cult. I decided to hide in plain sight, run for office, and become such a public figure that I would be untouchable. It worked, he lamented. Better than that, it opened me up to federal resources like satellites that I could use to monitor global radiation levels and find another source of Dixonite. I think I know how the... Wait, stop it. What just happened there? No undo. Did the undo button work? Yes, I did. Okay, good. It worked, he lamented. Better than that, it opened me up to federal resources like satellites I could use to monitor global radiation levels and find another source of Dixonite. I think I know how the story ends, Tanya said as her father reached the top and helped her up. Yes? <laughs> you found your Dixonite, and now you're only too quick to get rid of us. The catwalk there opened up into a platform at the top of the spire. In the very center was a small glass chamber with a single chair. The room was surrounded by computers, and her dad started typing away at the nearest one. "'It's not like I was just going to forget about you,' he said, looking away from the screen to meet her eyes. "'In the future, I was going to look you up at the first library I found and learn all your wonderful accomplishments.' Just think, he said, getting inside the small glass chamber. If I were to stay with you now, I'd never know all the things you would accomplish late in life. Now I'll get to see it all. Fuck that, Tanya said as the cha glass chamber sealed itself. The hiss drowning out her curse. She was starting to feel sick. She couldn't listen to any more. There was just no way that she was going to stand there and let her father walk out of the family. Didn't you think it curious that all these bees showed up even though I haven't even turned the machine on yet? Tanya's father asked. Don't you know what that means? He sat down in his chair. It means that this was inevitable. He pushed the only button on the chair, and Tanya realized she was too late. No! She screamed through the glass. All the monitors surrounding the glass chamber flashed with a five-minute countdown. Time dilation initiated, a voice through the computer said. Five minutes until full chronalization. Did you hear that? Tanya's dad asked from his chair. I came up with that word. Chronalization. Dixonite, too. Yeah, I figured, Tanya mumbled. Raising her voice, she leaned against the glass and asked, Dad, what's going on here? What do I, What did you do? I've started the process, he said. This chamber is being flooded with the energy from the Dixonite as we speak, like an invisible Dixon beam. I'm going to gradually slow down from your perspective. Oh no, that was not good. I don't think so, Tanya said, grabbing the nearest computer and ripping it free. Please don't do that, her father begged. It's all automated anyway. You'll only be causing a mess. Tanya stepped back and then threw the computer as hard as she could into the glass. The computer hit it and shattered into pieces, but the glass remained perfectly intact. I'd hate to brag, he said with an annoying smirk, but the chamber is made out of the same glass as a new iPhone. Unbreakable, he said. It's tempered, you know. Quite thick. Tanya was already starting to notice his voice getting sluggish. She slammed her fist angrily against the glass. Her father always had a way of getting his way. He was annoyingly like her in that regard, only she supposed he was better at it. I'm not letting you get away with this, Tanya yelled into the glass. Her father got off his chair and slowly approached the glass. I have another idea, 
he said to her, placing his hand opposite her fist on the glass. Come with me. Tanya was pretty sure her jaw dropped, but she was too busy having her mind blown to notice. Did she want to go into the future? Was that a thing she wanted to do? She'd never really thought about it before. Who wouldn't want to see the future? And was it worth it if she could never get back? Also, if she went with him, her dad would be getting away with trying to abandon her. Was she all right with giving up such an opportunity just for petty revenge? Absolutely. Yawn, yawn, yawn. Sorry about that. Absolutely. I can't come with you, she told her father. I don't abandon the people I care about. She glanced at a computer monitor. How much time do I have? She asked herself out loud. Four minutes. Plenty of time. For what? Her father yelled after her as she started for the ladder. You know you can't stop me. Tanya climbed over the side of the platform and took the ladder three rungs at a time. She was going too fast, apparently, and almost slipped to her certain death as an arm passed close by. Holding tight to the bars, she swung in a little hard, slamming her nose against a metal rung, like she needed a reminder she'd broken that. Maybe I can't stop you, she yelled back at him, jogging across the catwalk, but I think I know something that can. She was surprised to hear her dad's laughter over the hum of the machine as it powered up. The arms were spinning faster, and the catwalk shook as an arm passed directly beneath her. You sound like a chipmunk. She probably only had three minutes left. She estimated as much she estimated as much as she reached the bottom of the rickety staircase and started down another ladder. She supposed James Bond would have synced his watch with a timer or something, but it was far too late for her to be thinking of that now. She was almost there. She could see Rachel lying inanimate at the bottom, but getting to the teen vampire wasn't Tanya's immediate end. Oh my, excuse me. What she needed was the front door, and she was almost there. She got to the control pad beside the door and typed in the password to open it. Slowly, almost stubbornly so, the large blast doors unsealed and opened. There was one door. That, that was one door. The problem was that the outer door wouldn't open unless the inner door was closed. Unless, maybe it was jammed. Tanya searched the area for something, anything, that she could jam the massive doors with. There wasn't much not bolted down, except for an assortment of construction equipment littered all throughout the lab. Clearly construction had been rushed to get done on time. Amongst the small, tubes, amongst the small tools and a ladder, nothing strong enough to keep the door wedged open. Tanya spotted a couple leftover panes of that tempered glass her dad had been talking about. Would that work? There wasn't time to think it through. She had to just take the plunge. She crossed the catwalk, stumbled down the tight chain staircase, and grabbed the pane of glass. The trip back was more awkward, but Tanya made it even be made it in even better time. She put the coat into the console again, and the door started to close. She quickly, she quickly wedged the glass in between, and there was a loud, disturbing creak. <laughs> Tanya stepped away from the glass, worried it might explode into shards at any moment. Again, there was no time for worry. She just had to go with it. There must have only been 30 seconds left. It was now or never. She hit the switch for the outside door. A halt... halt... Oh, this should be in quotations. Oh, no, it should be bolded because it is written on screen. Okay, I get it. Um, she hit the switch for the outside door. Halt. A, a, a screen warned. Door two is ajar. Emergency release. Yes! Tanya yelled as if it would understand voice commands. It did. And the release hissed as the door began to open. Tanya didn't stay to watch her plan in action, knowing the spot she was standing on would be swarming with bees in no time. She crossed the catwalk and took the chain staircase down. Looking back was perhaps the worst decision of her life. She would never in her life see a, more, a sight more sublime in its horror 
Then the swarm of bees surging through the doorway like a long tendril reaching up and around the spire. It surged through the catwalks, ripping through them with pure brute strength. The swarm tore one of the spinning arms free from the spire, and it took out numerous catwalks on the way down, including Tanya's. Tanya let go of the ladder, leaping the last two stories to reach Rachel's side. Her landing hurt, but the pain was lasting on Tanya's mind. She pulled Rachel close to her and cowered as sparks flew around her. Wires, wires were spinning free and fires were starting. The bees weren't done, either. They continued around and then down, smashing through the spire once and then again below that. The entire thing began to collapse into three pieces, throwing up dust and debris as it crumbled heavily to the ground. Tanya was surrounded with some really horrific things, but nothing scared her more than the blank look on Rachel's face. The vampire's head tilted disturbingly in her lap. Tanya shifted, Ra shifted Rachel's head until it looked normal, wincing at the crack her neck made. Leaning in, Tanya covered the vampire as something exploded behind her. Tanya even couldn't even care less for the bees or the damage they caused. Rachel's eyes fluttered open, and she groggily looked up at Tanya with a smile spreading on her lips. Shauna, she whispered. Tanya sobbed, laughing despite the tears rolling down her face. <laughs> That was me trying to laugh and cry at the same time. Terrible. <laughs> she gave up even trying to hold them back and just let all her emotion explode from her in waves. Rachel pulled herself up and they held each other tightly. You okay? Rachel asked, seeing the disaster from over Tanya's shoulder. I, th I thought you were just going to talk to him. Tanya laughed, which only made her cry harder. If I'd lose you too, she managed to mutter. But you didn't, Rachel said, pulling away from Tanya and grinning. You're a little more squishy than I am, Rachel said. Shouldn't I be the one fussing over you? I can take care of myself, Tanya said, wiping the tears from her cheek and trying to take a deep breath. I mean, I, I did all this. Rachel laughed and Tanya moved in to kiss her, but the vampire pushed her away. You have no idea how tasty you smell right now, Rachel said. Right, Tanya said, her voice still unsteady. Pulling her pack of cigarettes from her pocket, she lit one and took a long drag. If ever a girl needed a smoke. Tanya could feel her sense of gravity returning with each inhale. She wasn't used to falling apart like that. Today has been one hell of a day, she said. Tell me about it, Rachel said, getting to her feet. She looked around. What happened to your father? Tanya shrugged. It had gotten to the point that she frankly couldn't care what had happened to him. The future, she suggested, or dead. Rachel crossed her arms. Well, there's three heartbeats in the rubble, she said, and Tanya almost dropped her smoke. Three? Two guards and her father? He had said the chamber was indestructible. Maybe it survived all that devastation, and he was sitting there even now untouched, waiting to be found. Little prick, Tanya said, taking another drag of her smoke. Can we be out of here before anyone finds him? Scene change. Scene change. Scene change. It was good they left when they did. As they got in Tanya's van, Rachel's mom pulled up right past them. Her attention was elsewhere, and Rachel was fairly certain she hadn't noticed them or certainly hadn't or certainly she'd have reacted. That was close, Tanya said, tossing her smoke out the window. It's good she's here, Rachel told Tanya. She'll call a crew to get your father out. I really couldn't care less about that asshole. Tanya said, buckling her seatbelt. Rachel couldn't help massaging her forehead, while Tanya put the van into drive. Her head was fuzzy, woozy ever since br breaking her neck. Maybe it was from her debilitating hunger. At least the loud buzzing sound was finally gone, and the relative silence was golden. The swarm of bees were gone, and it was in fact a beautifully sunny day, almost as if there had never been any bees at all. But everything was exceptionally quiet, and lawns were strewn with litter and debris. There were a few people unsteadily getting to their feet, and many more not getting up at all, but most everyone else managed to get to shelter, and they were only now peeking their heads into the light. The radio was blaring some ballad, but under that Rachel could hear the theme song to Reboot. It had been her favorite cartoon as a kid, and Rachel quickly realized that it was coming from her iPhone. My mom, she said with a glance at the large screen. Tanya turned off the radio and pulled to the side of the road. Rachel hit the talk button as Tanya slowed to a stop and turned off the engine. Bringing the phone to her ear, Rachel tried her best to sound concerned as she said quickly, Mom, are you alright? 
I'm fine, her mother said. Are you still at school? Of course, Rachel lied. We all gather together in the gym. Good, her mother said through the phone. I'm glad. Look, can you pick up your brother? I'm going to be held up for the next while. Also check on your father and tell him I love him. She hung up, Rachel said as she lowered the phone from her ear. She supposed that conversation had gone better than she'd hoped, but she was kind of disappointed her mother hadn't been more concerned for her. Tanya started the car again. So where to? I'm supposed to pick up my brother, Rachel said, almost forgetting. All she could think about was the beating of Tanya's heart. She liked Tanya's heart. As much as the rest of her, it had its own rhythm. Ba-dump, ba-dump, ba-dump. Rachel! What? Rachel asked, rudely awoken from a trance by her friend. I was asking if you had any ideas on how to help Alice. The truth, wa the, the truth was, Tanya said, the truth was, Rachel had been trying not to think about what had happened to Alice. It was easy when everyone was in emergency mode, but now that Code Black was over, well, she supposed a new one would begin over Alice. She was tired of it. She had quite enough action for one day. Breaking her neck and blacking out for half an hour was scary enough. She could have died. Again. More importantly, she was tired of Eckhart destroying everything in her life. Plan A is killing the vampire who brainwashed her, she told Tanya. Do we know if that will work? It's unproven, Rachel admitted. She still thought it sounded pretty darn good on paper. They honestly didn't even know if the brainwashing might not just wear off on its own after any amount of time. Days, weeks, even years. Couldn't we just find Eckhart, Tanya suggested, and try to get him to reverse what he did? I'd really rather kill him, Rachel said honestly. And can you? I've been training in my dreams, Rachel told Tanya, fully aware of how crazy she sounded. Tanya took the news well. Like the Matrix, she suggested. Rachel nodded. I've got a sword at home, and I'm going to use it to cut off Eckhart's head, she said out loud with confidence. Tanya didn't need to know her confidence was only skin deep. And if you succeed, but Alice still can't talk? Tanya asked. What's plan B? I don't know, Rachel said with a sigh. I could turn her into a vampire. It worked for me. It wasn't a suggestion she made with any intention of follow-through. She wouldn't wish her hunger on anyone. Better to be silent. They drove up to Abbey Park High School just as their friends were celebrating on their way out the front door. Tanya found an umbrella in the back seat and handed it to Rachel before finding a place to park. Hey guys, called Andrew, following Mike and Jason out the school's side door. Nice weather we're having. I don't think I see a single bee anywhere, Mike said, spinning in circles. It'll be... I'll be happy if I never see those bugs again, Tanya yelled after them. Alice was the next to the doors, and Tanya swept her up into a bear hug. Seeing them, Andrew turned and spread his arms. Yo, Rachel, he said. You got a hug for the A-dog? Michael stopped spinning long enough to punch Andrew in the gut. Never call yourself that again, he said sternly. Ah! Oh! Andrew fell to his knees and muttered, That really hurt. Had to lay down a whoop-ass so you'd learn, Mike told his friend. It was for your own good. You'll thank me one day. He offered Andrew a hand. Speaking of, Andrew said as he got back to his feet, How much ass did you whoop today, Rachel? Not enough she said, unsure of how much to tell them. Tanya didn't want them to know the mayor was her father, right? I was out cold for half an hour. Tanya did all the hard work. Why hadn't they gotten their story straight on the drive over? Or had they? Why hadn't she been paying attention? Ba-dump. 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 Ass got whooped, Rachel heard Tanya said, say, her arm still around Alice. I brought the whole thing down on top of the guy. Nice, Mike said, throwing Tanya a high five. Andrew moved to follow, but Tanya lowered her hand. No way. Where's Ian? Rachel asked the boys as Bilal was the last one through the door. Jason shrugged. He was with us back in the lab. Alice started typing into her phone and hit send. A moment later, Tanya's phone beeped and she pulled it out. Al Alice says Ian went to the bathroom an hour ago and never came back, Tanya read to them. Rachel looked to, eat, to Andrew, Jason, and Bilal for more, but they all just shrugged. Aha! Maybe he ran home to check on his family, Bilal suggested. Jason nodded in agreement. I'd have done the same, but I really don't give a crap about my family. 
Rachel knew where Jason was coming from. His family really did suck. My parents probably didn't even notice anything was wrong, Andrew said. Aha, and my mom lives in Burlington, Bilal said, his house being outside the swarm. Well, I have to go check on my brother, Rachel told them. After we take him home, can we try to find Ian? She didn't mention grabbing a pouch of blood, but that was the underlying reality. Everything at that point was secondary to her need to eat. I'm going to stay with Alice. Tanya told Rachel as Alice said something to her via text. She has a right to know everything, Tanya stated, though the look she was though the look she shared with Rachel seemed much more like she was asking for permission. Every gory detail. All right, Rachel said. She did feel bad for Alice, and couldn't imagine what the auburn hair haired teen was going through without even knowing why. Tanya was right, it wasn't fair. I should split too. Mike told them, pulling sunglasses from the collar of his shirt and putting them on. I've got my own brother to check up on. See you losers later. They, they parted ways, with Tanya leading Alice into the school, and soon it was just Rachel, Andrew, Jason, and Bilal. You know, Andrew said as they crossed the street, I think the cool quota of this group just went down like 100%. Aha, speak for yourself, Bilal said, stepping with disgust over a dead squirrel. What's a hundred percent of zero? Jason asked. You know, you know, Bilal said with a look around. Ha ha, I was expecting so much more mess. He scratched his head, and I thought everything would be a lot more sticky. Like a big coat of honey over the, whole, the entire city? Jason asked Bilal. Rachel saw him raise an eyebrow as Bilal clearly, uh, at Bilal's clearly inaccurate understanding of bees, as if they just flew around excreting honey everywhere. People were still just beginning to come out of their homes, and there was a lot of chaos and confusion with people asking complete strangers for more information. How'd it happen? It seemed a common question. Where did all the bees come from? Was another. Rachel could hear a parent in a nearby house soothing her kid who'd been play caught playing outside when the swarm hit. She couldn't quite piece together what had happened to the kid, besides getting stung, of course. There was more to the story, though. Rachel could smell his blood all over the front yard. Ba-dump. 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 A sudden thought occurred to Rachel that made her almost stop. Could she be trusted out of school? Could she be trusted in a building filled with little hearts beating proudly to the beat of their own drums? What had her life come to if she couldn't even trust herself around kids? Was she still even herself anymore? Or was she some kind of vampire monster now pretending to be her? Was she the one hungering to eat little kids, or was that a completely different entity just sharing her body? There were heartbeats everywhere, a cascade of drums beating down at her from all sides, every house they passed, hundreds, and then hundreds more from the school. She couldn't even guess at what her friends were talking about anymore, but nor did she care. She just wanted to feed. And then her ears noticed a different beating, one she never bothered to listen to and had almost forgotten it even existed. Rachel heard the sound of her own heartbeat. She'd figured her mind usually filtered it out automatically so as to keep her from going into a frenzy just any time, but she supposed with her ears actively seeking any beating hearts, the sound just sort of snuck through. She couldn't even be a vampire very well. Weren't they supposed to be dead? She supposed it made sense to have a beating heart. After all, even vampires needed to be able to plump blood through their bodies. Else why would a stake through the heart be so deadly if the heart wasn't important? All that said, the heartbeat meant so much more to Rachel because it meant she wasn't the monster portrayed on TV. Maybe the underworld vampires. Didn't they have heartbeats? The point was, she was still fundamentally human, and it was that thought that allowed her to suppress her hunger, at least for the moment. Oh, excuse me. Okay, excuse me. Water break? Do 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 do. Water break? Do 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 do. Water break? Aha, there's your brother, Bilal said, snapping Rachel from her semi-trance. She could smell him, from where he was running up the hill to join them. There was a girl following behind him, absorbed in her Nintendo handheld. Hey, sis, Jacob said. Try not to get a tan or anything, he joked her as she waved to him from under Tanya's umbrella. You're back, the little girl following him said. Jacob pulled his own game from his pocket and quickly opened it. You finished that wave on your own? He asked with surprise. I told you I was good, she said with a mischievous grin. She had brown 
hair, short enough for the tips to just touch her shoulders. She was also Jacob's height, and the two looked a little creepy walking side by side with their faces planted firmly in their game, like the creepy kids from a Stephen King movie. So, what, who's your friend? Andrew asked, eyeing the girl's Ninja Turtle backpack with respect. It was shaped like, like a turtle shell. Sabrina, the girl introduced herself without looking up from her game. And did either of you notice a bee swarm? Rachel asked, walking backwards to keep an eye on her brother. Or were you both too distracted by your game? It was impossible to miss, Sabrina said, rolling her eyes. Everyone was freaking out, except for Jacob. He wasn't even scared a little. The boy without fear, Andrew said, offering the kid his hand for a fist bump. Jacob accepted. Yeah, he said with a shrug. I had that shit in check. Where have you been learning language like that? Rachel asked. Have you been talking to Gordon? No, Jacob told her with a roll of his eyes. Our class is a, has a black kid, too. Seven, actually. Though the five guys are cool enough. It's just those two girls from the UK. And that really bad-mouthed Palestinian boy. Sabrina was quick to point out. Oh, I should have gone with a loud, um. And that really bad-mouthed Palestinian boy. Sabrina was quick to point out with a raise of her finger. The one that looked like he's ten? Jacob asked. You're only twelve, Rachel reminded him. Yeah, and yet when he stands next to me, I feel like Andre the Giant, Jacob said. He reminds me of, like, an ugly little poodle or a shih tzu that won't stop yapping at all at the bigger dogs. Speaking of that annoying twerp... Sabrina said as she finally glanced around at the group. What's a donkey punch? Rachel flinched and noticed Jason fidget awkwardly. Blal didn't seem to know the answer, but Andrew thought he had the tact he had the tact to tackle the girl's question. Sometimes, when a man loves a woman, the nerd said carefully, he um surprises her with a punch to the back of her head after sex. Ah Sabrina said as her attention returned to the game. Now I understand what he was trying to tell me about him and my mother. Aha! Bilal said with a shake of his head. That's horrible. My family should have a talk with his family. Bilal let his family do all the fighting for him, Jason said. Don't make fun of me, Bilal said. In my culture, family is most important. Rachel considered what Bilal said and knew she wouldn't hesitate to give her life to save any of the people she cared about. Maybe their cultures weren't so different. Jason shrugged and said almost too casually, If that's true, then all you guys are my family because blood doesn't stand for shit. You guys are more like my family than my parents have ever been. Same, Rachel said. Ew, Jacob complained, his lip curling at his sister. I don't want to be related to you. Rachel stuck out her tongue at him. Mm. They passed a Pakistani man handing out pamphlets. The red in his eyes suggesting that he had been crying openly only very recently. The jitters in his hand implied he hadn't slept. Rachel took his pamphlet out of out of pity. Please, he told Jason. My daughter's missing. If you see her, just call that number. There is supposed to be an, an assembly about her, Jacob remembered. It got cancelled when the bees attacked. The page had a picture of the girl, but it was rather blurry. It had been taken from a weird side angle. From what Rachel could tell, the girl couldn't be any older than three years. Man, that kid could be, like, right in front of me and I'd have no clue, Andrew admitted as he snatched the paper from Rachel and compared the picture to a group of kindergartners leaving the school. All these toddlers just look the same to me, he pointed to one in particular. Is that one even a boy or a girl, or, or neither? I like your older friends. Sabrina whispered to Jacob with a nod, nudge to his ribs. Yeah, he said with disinterest. They're pretty all right. Feel the love, Andrew muttered, scratching under his sling. He was going to have to wear it for another week until the stitches had time to heal. Rachel could see her house, and the thought of blood took control again. Her pace quickened, heading straight for the open door. The vampire stopped. No one's home, she said, her arms cr coming out in warning for the others behind her to stop. How can you tell? Jacob asked, but Rachel just ignored him. Where was her dad? Was he out somewhere when the bees hit? Was he all right? Why did he leave the door open? And why could she smell his blood on the porch? Jacob, 
being as impatient as he was, pushed past everyone and hopped the front porch onto the house. Dad, he called, but as Rachel expected, there was no answer. There was, however, a thick letter in the mailbox, and she carefully pulled it free. Who's it from? Jason asked as the gang crowded around her. Their hearts were too distracting, and she tried to shrug them away. Stepping inside, she tore open the envelope and pulled out a plain white folded card. There was nothing on the front. It says, Rachel read after opening the card, You are cordially invited to witness a union between the late Eckhart Gaines and the young Ms. Rachel Lynn Smith. Ha ha ha! Nice of him to invite you to your own wedding, Bilal pointed out. Rachel finally convinced herself to start reading again and kept reading. It's at St. Reynolds Catholic Church tonight at eleven. She dropped like a bomb onto the stairs, her mind spinning with, ter with horror. That place is so tacky, Andrew told them. Have you seen the inside? She had, in fact, and even if she would even want to get married, she knew she'd never be getting married there. There was one more thing on the invite. Confirmed guests include Ian Fletcher and Eric Smith, Rachel muttered, the note falling from her hand. Everyone had suddenly gone really quiet, except, of course, the steady beating of their hearts. Jason stepped forward and picked up the invite to read it himself. It was on very thick parchment and seemed to have been handwritten. Can we assume that now? Can, can we assume now that Ian didn't run home after the bee swarm? Jason said, trying to put everything in perspective. He's been taken hostage with your dad, and the only way it seems we can get them back is to meet him at, at this church tonight. Wait, Jacob said, rejoining them in the front hall. Who's taken dad and Ian? Rachel didn't want her family to know her secret, but how could she not tell her brother now? And now is the worst possible time. Jacob, she said, take your friend up to your room. No, Jacob said, folding his arms. I'm old enough. I want answers. Fine, Rachel said, getting up. Then I'll go. She climbed the stairs, leaving Jacob incredibly flustered in her wake, and slammed the door to her room behind her. Her life was falling apart, and Eckhart had known exactly where to strike. It was as if he'd been watching her. Would she have noticed? She was only sure of one thing. She was hungry. Grabbing a patch of blood from the mini-fridge she'd installed in her closet, she bit into it and began sucking back the miracle juice like an alcoholic with a forty of Jack Daniels. She didn't even notice Andrew open the door behind her. "'Please tell me you're coming up with a plan up here,' Andrew said, sneaking into her room with Bilal J and Jason close behind. "'Right,' he said as Rachel continued to suck away at the bag. "'We'll just wait for you to finish drinking your blood then.' Andrew couldn't, of course, stay quiet that long and continued. But we have to go. Ian needs our help. And you know your dad. Oh, and you know your dad. Ha ha, are you insane? Bilal told Andrew, his hands going to his hips in a pose that too closely resembled one his mother often made to him. If we go into that church, there's no guarantee any of us will be coming out alive. It is most likely a trap, Jason added to his opinion. But we can't leave any man behind. That rule is ever more important when vampires are involved. That shit is contagious like an STD. It's not your fight, Rachel said, dropping the empty blood bag on the floor. She then grabbed a second one. After all, she needed all the strength, all her strength when taking on Eckhart. You should all go home and let me take care of Eckhart myself. Aha! It's sad when the vampire is a is rational person in the room, besides me, Blal said, adding quickly. And maybe, Jason. I can be rational, Andrew argued. I have a plan. Ha, oh, this should be good, Bilal said. Rachel will distract Eckhart, explained Andrew, while we rescue Ian and Rachel's dad. Bilal asked, ha, oh, and then what? We go home and play Xbox, Andrew suggested in the form of a question. That's not really a plan, Jason said. Whatever, Andrew said with a frown. Planning is hard. If we're going to do this, Jason said, we're going to need to arm ourselves. He put his hand down his camo pants, and Bilal was about to complain when the military-obsessed teen pulled out a wooden stake. Holy shit, J Jason, Andrew said, and Bilal's jaw dropped. Aha, where the hell did you get that? Jason looked around at them, surprised by their overreactions. It's mine, he told them. I whittled it when all this began. He crossed his arms. Surely all of you took similar precautions. Not really, Bilal admitted. Honestly, I didn't even know whittle was a word. 
I've been eating a lot of garlic lately, Andrew said, though I really like garlic. Well, we'll need more than these, Jason told them, raising his handcrafted weapon, and anything else we, th we can think of. This isn't the time to fight fair. We need to know everything we have at we need to throw everything we have at him, and maybe a little more. We have to be smart about this. All right, Rachel said as she lowered her blood bag and let it fall from her hands. Here's what we're going to do. And that's the end of the chapter. Chapter thirteen, which will be the climax of the book, is uh, entitled Eat Shit and Die. And I will be reading that later. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of A Suburban Fantasy, read and presented by 99geek.ca. Um, feel free to go there to if you like this and wanted to catch up faster, didn't want to wait for the next chapter. Uh, there are thousands of pages of content on my Patreon page right now, which is available by link through at 99geek.ca. But uh, the link for Patreon is patreon.com slash 99 geek and uh, there it's only a dollar, and then you get access to monthly chapters as they come out. Um, there's some really great uh, content there. I, I'm writing more than just one book now. I'm actually writing five books at once. Uh, each month a different book that I put out. Um, this month is Urban Fantasy, so it's, it is a story. Um, just quite a number of, uh, quite a good 400 pages later. So, uh, again, if you ever wanted to catch up, you can always just subscribe on my Patreon. But short of that, uh, look, you can look forward to this next chapter sometime uh, soon. And uh, as I said, Urban Fantasy is coming out this month on patreon.com slash 99geek and uh, also 99geek.ca. It's, um, it's a really, uh, it's going to be good, I'm sure. Rachel was recently taken against her will. And her whole group's going to have to try and cope without her, which is going to be interesting. Anyway, that's the end of that. Uh, I'm going to hit the end stream button.